Hello, I'm Brad Dickerson, Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School, and it's my pleasure to be with you today for the second Dubai Neurology Hybrid Congress. I'd like to thank Dr. Tayeb for inviting me to be part of the program. I'm gonna to speak today on neuroimaging and the diagnosis of neurodegenerative disorders. I like to start with uh, uh, information from a patient, and these are some paintings from a patient of mine with frontotemporal dementia. You can see clearly the temporal lobe atrophy in this patient who had semantic dementia. Here are my disclosures. None of them are relevant to the material I'll speak about today. This is the overall uh, progression of Alzheimer's disease uh, from a, a model perspective with a similar model for many other diseases like it, where people go through a, a pre-symptomatic phase with accumulating pathology, gradually beginning to be symptomatic in a prodromal stage and ultimately developing dementia. In terms of imaging and other biomarkers in clinical practice, I like to think about it as ultimately uh, helping us to understand what the patient's uh, uh, clinical status is uh, from the perspective of symptoms and signs, which uh, arises as a result of changes in brain anatomy and physiologies, which is what the imaging can show us. Ultimately, this comes from brain pathology, which we're increasingly developing molecular biomarkers for that can be measured through imaging. So now we're able to say, for example, with diagnostic criteria for Alzheimer's disease, that a patient has preclinical Alzheimer's disease if they have biomarkers consistent with AD pathophysiology, or that if they're symptomatic and they have MCI, it's highly likely due to AD or likely not due to AD based on those uh, molecular biomarkers. And the same with dementia, uh, highly likely due to AD, uh, which is often referred to as Alzheimer's disease dementia, or highly likely not due to AD. So let's start with the most straightforward uh, identification of brain pathology through CT or MRI. Obviously, we'll focus on Alzheimer's disease uh, in this talk, but there are many other causes of dementia, and we have to keep in mind a broad differential diagnosis in some patients' situations. So first, uh, structural measures of brain pathology uh, can identify contributors to cognitive or behavioral impairment, such as cerebrovascular disease, tumor, or other lesions. These are relatively uncommon in a patient that has a typical presentation of Alzheimer's disease, but should be surveyed in any case. They can also identify changes consistent with specific types of neurodegenerative disease, which I'll go through in a moment. Of course, cerebrovascular disease is a very common cause of dementia, and it's often very obvious on CT or MRI. Normal pressure hydrocephalus should be considered when people have uh, ventricular enlargement out of proportion to sulcal atrophy. And diseases like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease have specific signatures of hyperintensity on diffusion-weighted imaging, such as the cortical ribboning pattern you see here. So when we think about neurodegenerative dementias, we often think about MRI scans or CT scans as revealing patterns of regional atrophy that may suggest a particular cause. Here's a classic case of Alzheimer's disease with medial temporal lobe atrophy, which you can see here with a atrophic hippocampus bilaterally, uh, ventricles are enlarged, and more posteriorly, you can see the biparietal atrophy that's often very typical of the, this disease. It's harder to see this on axial imaging, which is why I like to get coronal MRI scans, but you can certainly see the anterior hippocampal atrophy on this cut from the axial MRI. Here's a case of frontotemporal dementia, where if you look from the sagittal perspective, you can really see the striking frontal atrophy and anterior temporal atrophy that spares the posterior cortex. Here's a patient with PPA, primary progressive aphasia, due to semantic, uh, with a semantic presentation, which ultimately turned out to be due to frontotemporal lobar degeneration, uh, TDP43 type, and you can see the asymmetric and striking ventral and lateral temporal atrophy in addition to the medial temporal atrophy. Here's a patient with non-fluent primary progressive aphasia with left frontoinsular and dorsolateral prefrontal atrophy, sparing the temporal uh, pole. Similarly, here's a patient with left anterior temporal lobe atrophy from the uh, uh, axial perspective with sparing of the frontal cortex. And here's a patient with posterior cortical atrophy with striking parietal atrophy, which when viewed from the um, 
axial perspective, you can really see the sparing of the prefrontal cortex and viewed from the sagittal perspective, you can see what looks like almost a mirror image of the patient with frontotemporal dementia that I showed you earlier, where the posterior cortex is strikingly atrophic. And this patient turned out to have the uh, PCA due to Alzheimer's disease pathology, which is most common in this rare clinical syndrome. Progressive supranuclear palsy has midbrain atrophy with the um, hummingbird or king penguin sign, which you don't see in Parkinson's disease or multiple systems atrophy. And increasingly, we're starting to see the use of volumetrics in the clinic where, for example, you can see in this report that the patient has a, a hippocampal volume that's below the fifth percentile for that person's age and a ventricular volume that's a, a, a above the 95th percentile for that a person's age. So now let's turn to uh, looking at brain function through FDG-PET. FDG-PET is a measure of cerebral glucose metabolism, which is a reflection of synaptic function. And the major use in the US in terms of Medicare reimbursement is Alzheimer's disease versus frontotemporal dementia. But as we'll discuss, there are many other uses beyond that. Here's an example of the patient uh, with Alzheimer's disease in the middle and a patient with frontotemporal dementia on the right. And compared to a person who's a healthy older adult, you can see the posterior temporal parietal hypometabolism in Alzheimer's and the anterior asymmetric, in this case, a temporal and frontal hypometabolism in FTD. In um, people with mild cognitive impairment, you can often see the form frust of what uh, is the temporal parietal hypometabolism if their uh, condition is due to Alzheimer's disease, but it can often be subtle. So uh, sometimes surface projections and quantitative analysis of FDG PET is useful. Here's an example of a surface projection of um, the image that shows a prominent temporal parietal, posterior temporal and parietal hypometabolism that's um, relatively symmetrical, a little bit more prominent in the right hemisphere than in the left hemisphere. Um, and you can really see that there's relatively little frontal hypometabolism, although there is some. In contrast, if the patient has frontotemporal dementia, they typically have prominent frontal hypometabolism as seen here, and in this case has a, a little bit of anterior temporal hypometabolism as well, with a little bit of parietal hypometabolism that's much lower in magnitude than the frontal. And of course, there are cases where it's difficult to differentiate, in this case, uh, frontal, parietal, and temporal hypometabolism that's left lateralized. Um, and this may be a situation where you need uh, additional imaging or other molecular biomarkers to try to figure out if this is a frontotemporal lobar degeneration or Alzheimer's disease that is causing this person's uh, hypometabolism and symptoms. Here's a patient who had very early stage Alzheimer's at the stage of mild cognitive impairment, and you can see relatively mild uh, posterior temporal and parietal hypometabolism that's right lateralized but the presence of the posterior cingulate precuneus hypometabolism uh, in the right hemisphere as well, really suggested to me what ultimately turned out to be the case, which was a, the beginnings of a progressive dementia that was at the MCI stage and ultimately um, became obvious as a form of Alzheimer's disease. In progressive supranuclear palsy, there's FDG hypometabolism in prefrontal cortex, as well as subcortical structures, including putamen and uh, subthalamic nucleus and midbrain, but this is often a classic presentation that uh, is not always something that people think of when they think of PSP in terms of the cortical involvement. And then in dementia with Lewy bodies, there's the cingulate island sign with hy occipital hypometabolism, uh, and you can see that this on PET or SPECT and the uh, in Lewy body, you see the preservation of the cingulate posterior cingulate cortex metabolic rate uh, shown by the arrow, uh, whereas in Alzheimer's, this is an area of reduced metabolism. A study by Jonathan Graf Radford out of the Mayo Clinic showed that uh, the uh, presence of neurofibrillary tangles in patients followed to autopsy was the um, really the basis of the cingulate island sign with the patients that had a lesser degree of concomitant neurofibrillary tangle pathology having a more prominent cingulate island sign with sparing of the posterior cingulate cortex in terms of metabolism. 
Then we have dopamine transporter SPECT imaging that is often useful in evaluating patients with Parkinson's disease or with dementia and extrapyramidal dysfunction suggestive of Parkinsonism with the reduction of dop dopamine transporter imaging as shown in the cases on the right, suggestive of uh, the presence of Lewy body pathology. The European Association of Nuclear Medicine and European Academy of Neurology published a, an outstanding evidence-based uh, Delphi consensus recommendation for the use of FDG PET in the evaluation of patients with cognitive impairment and dementia thought to be due to neurodegenerative disease. And their review of the evidence really showed uh, um, clear um, use of FDG PET for supporting the diagnostic evaluation of a whole host of situations. Um, MCI thought to be due to AD, MCI thought to be due to FTLD or due to DLB all had strong support. Um, atypical Alzheimer's differential diagnosis between uh, a variety of these different forms of dementia all also had strong support. Differential diagnosis between PSP and, and PD, as well as uh, to support the diagnosis of cortical basal syndrome or primary progressive aphasia, all with strong support from the evidence. So I'd encourage you to read the summary paper uh, and the accompanying detailed papers from this excellent work if you want more uh, review of the evidence of where FDG PET can be useful for the diagnostic evaluation of patients with these conditions. The MRI method of uh, arterial spin labeled perfusion studies uh, has received support as a, a correlate of what you see with glucose um, PET, so that uh, at some point and in some centers, we'll probably be seeing more use of this uh, uh, perfusion technique, uh, which can be acquired during a regular MRI session, um, so that uh, a more cost effective approach to this might be uh, uh, ASL MRI. In most centers that I'm familiar with, this has not yet uh, become something that is available in clinical practice and is still uh, primarily a research tool. So now let's turn to um, um, imaging biomarkers of amyloid and tau. First, we have um, the Pittsburgh compound B that came on the scene almost 20 years ago now with amyloid imaging with PET showing clear evidence of neuritic uh, fibrillar plaque deposition in the top uh, images, but uh, an absent scan in a person that is thought to be a um, healthy older adult. Uh, and you can see it in pre-symptomatic Alzheimer's disease, and this is a genetic presenilin um, mutation carrier who did not yet have symptoms, but had a, a prominent amyloid PET signal. So in the US, we have three uh, F18 amyloid PET tracers that have been approved by the FDA. And um, these are, are still not yet reimbursed outside of the VA healthcare system, but uh, are being further evaluated uh, for their utility. All of these PET tracers have been um, studied in cohorts that have been followed to autopsy and have shown a strong relationship to the presence of, uh, neuri of neuro uh, neuritic plaques, um, so that the uh, absence of neuritic plaques is uh, typically associated with very low signal on an amyloid PET, even if a patient has symptoms due to dementia, due to FTLD or um, primary Lewy body pathology, they would have an absent uh, signal on the amyloid PET tracers. It's important to keep in mind a patient's age when obtaining an amyloid PET scan though, because as reviewed in this study from 2015, the older a person is, even when they're cognitively normal over age 60, the more likely they are to have amyloid plaques in their brain. You can see upwards of 40% of people with normal cognition by the age of 80 having amyloid plaques in their brain. So when you have a patient that has um, symptoms of mild cognitive impairment, the older they are, the more you have to question whether the amyloid plaques are associated with tangles and likely causing symptoms uh, or potentially there as a, uh, an incidental finding. So uh, Keith Johnson led the appropriate use criteria imaging task force for amyloid imaging and uh, summarized the appropriate use as follows. In a patient with a cognitive complaint with objectively confirmed impairment, performed after a full standard workup is completed, and when AD is a possible diagnosis, but there is diagnostic uncertainty 
Uh, they also felt that that this should be ordered by experts in dementia and not um, available to primary care clinicians or uh, others who are not primarily uh, specialists in dementia. Inappropriate use would be for evaluation of ind individuals without cognitive complaints, but it should be acknowledged that preclinical AD may become an indication for amyloid imaging if preventative treatments that are in trials right now are proved to be effective, which would be very exciting. And uh, amyloid PET imaging is inappropriate if a standard recommend, uh, recommended clinical diagnostic evaluation has not been performed. Um, and as a standalone diagnostic assessment for AD dementia or to assess disease progression, this would be, these would be considered inappropriate uses. So am amyloid PET has been evaluated for uh, its practical utility uh, in clinical management in the US by uh, the IDEA study led by Gil Rabinovich uh, with 18,000 Medicare beneficiaries having this incorporated as part of their routine clinical uh, diagnostic evaluation at, at uh, specialty dementia centers. This is the initial publication, which showed that the um, first 16,000 participants whose data were evaluated um, showed that there was quite a, a discrepancy in terms of the clinical diagnosis and the, um, what the amyloid PET showed. And so the um, clinician's diagnosis changed from Alzheimer's disease to a non-Alzheimer diagnosis uh, and from a non-Alzheimer diagnosis to an Alzheimer diagnosis in a substantial fraction of the cases. And this was associated with changes in, in management as well as changes in plans for additional diagnostic testing. So these data are felt to be fairly strong support for the idea that amyloid PET has practical utility, even in the absence at the time of uh, disease-modifying therapies, which obviously with the uh, controversial approval of aducanumab for accelerated approval by the FDA in the US, uh, this would be a completely different story, but um, the jury is out in terms of whether this is gonna be something that's paid for by Medicare. But ultimately, if the treatments become available that are targeting amyloid, obviously we're gonna wanna know if a patient has amyloid in their brain before we give them a treatment. The most recent imaging biomarker to come on the scene is tau PET imaging. And this was also approved by the FDA in the US uh, now almost two years ago, uh, but is very hard to obtain uh, primarily because the distribution network and uh, reimbursement is not there yet. So I think uh, we're, we're at a point where we have an, an incredible host of tools to measure the um, molecular biomarkers of Alzheimer's pathology in the brain, but uh, we're not yet able to use these in routine clinical practice under most circumstances because of lack of reimbursement. So this is a, an example of a paper we published which shows the uh, presence of tau PET in the upper left here signal, uh, which is co-localized very strongly with atrophy in this individual patient with typical AD dementia. Whereas the signal from amyloid PET is not co-localized with atrophy. Um, amyloid tends to go to uh, lateral and medial parietal and temporal cortices, as well as prefrontal cortices in most patients that develop amyloid plaques in the brain. And um, as we know in Alzheimer's disease, this is not typically a part of the brain that is affected in terms of the prefrontal cortex, at least in the early stages of the disease. So uh, whether we look at hypometabolism or atrophy, the uh, localization of tau PET signal is really strongly uh, overlapping in terms of where in the brain we see evidence of neurofibrillary tangles. This has been shown by a number of other uh, investigators, especially in, uh, with atrophy and with hypometabolism. So I wanna close by presenting a case and then talking a little bit more about some of the implications of the data that I showed today. This is a professor who was a former English professor who uh, was 78 years old and developed gradually progressive visual and spatial symptoms. She first started to notice that she uh, hadn't seen something she should have seen uh, and, and noticed that this happened when she was in her um, house or uh, when she was out walking or even driving. Uh, 
This led her to recognize that she really shouldn't be driving, and so um, she stopped driving, but she had otherwise intact instrumental activities of daily living and lived by herself and functioned very highly. However, when she was in her apartment, um, she found that she was increasingly unsure of where things were. She would find that she would look for her purse at least five times a day and sometimes wouldn't see it even when it was right in front of her. This was especially true when she left it on her couch, which had a similar color to her purse. When it was on the table, she would often be able to see it more readily because of the high degree of contrast between her dark purse and her light color colored table. She also had um, difficulty recognizing familiar people by their face, even including her own son. But when he would speak, she would recognize him by his voice. And sometimes she would even uh, say that she could tell it was him by the way he walked. So this is acquired prosopagnosia, uh, suggesting problems in the ventral visual stream, uh, as well as uh, acquired um, simultanagnosia and other uh, spatial impairments uh, referable to the dorsal visual stream. She had changes in her ability to carry out other visual tasks like reading maps, finding letters on the keyboard. She felt she had no tactile memory, as she put it, uh, with the idea that she couldn't figure out where her fingers were in, in space. She also had trouble writing a check, uh, remembering what information to put where on the check and being able to see the lines appropriately. On neurologic exam and cognitive testing, she had impaired visual and constructional ability with evidence of simultanagnosia and prosopagnosia, uh, supporting the symptoms that she reported and that her son confirmed. Otherwise, her cognitive function was intact. So our diagnostic formulation at this point was that she had mild cognitive impairment because she was largely intact in her activities of daily living with a visual predominant non-amnestic syndrome. Her memory was excellent. So uh, we said that she had a progressive visuospatial syndrome consistent with the posterior cortical atrophy syndrome. We obtained uh, MRI, and you can see from these axial images that there is um, atrophy in the occipitotemporal cortex shown here on the left image with the arrow pointing to the uh, uh, ventral occipitotemporal cortex. And you can see quite widened sulci in this area, um, more so on the right than on the left. And also occipital parietal atrophy, again, a little bit more prominent on the right than on the left, both medially and laterally, with relatively intact uh, cortex throughout the rest of her brain, including the um, medial temporal lobe, except uh, some atrophy being present on the right. So here's her FDG PET. Um, she had very obvious focal hypometabolism that was bilateral, but most prominent in the right occipitotemporal cortex as shown here, uh, and the right occipital parietal cortex as shown here. You can see similar findings on, on the um, left hemisphere, but to a much lesser degree. When we looked at her amyloid PET scan, she had amyloid in the places that I said uh, before that it tends to like to go. Um, bilaterally in the retrosplenial and, and uh, medial parietal regions, um, lateral uh, temporal parietal regions, and also lateral and medial prefrontal cortex. Not at all consistent with where her atrophy and hypometabolism are. But if we review once again her uh, PET, uh, FDG PET hypometabolic uh, pattern, we can see then when we get tau PET, that this is almost a, a mirror image of what we see with tau PET. So here's the tau PET, and you can see the uh, elevated signal in the occipital temporal region and the occipital parietal region, uh, right greater than left, again, almost like a mirror image of the FTG PET scan. And I'll just flip back and forth between those for a moment so you can see how incredibly matched those are uh, inversely. So it's really pretty clear that as the pathologists have told us over the years, it's uh, the, uh, the tangles that are really co-localized with neurodegeneration and um, uh, co-localized with what we see on glucose PET as hypometabolism and MRI as atrophy. So we ultimately diagnosed this patient with um, the MCI, visual predominant non-amnestic syndrome, uh, progressive visual spatial, PCA syndrome, and the cause is highly likely Alzheimer's disease as it often is in this rare condition. Uh, 
So the roles of imaging and dementia evaluation in clinical practice are, are expanding um, as we see new modalities that are becoming available, even though in many practice settings, these are not yet uh, accessible. Routine MRI is an important first step to evaluate for various forms of pathology, and high-resolution MRI may be useful for identifying atrophy patterns suggestive of a partic particular disease in the brain and supportive of a particular clinical syndrome. I like to get uh, 3D uh, T1-weighted scans, as well as T2-weighted scans with, with FLAIR for uh, uh, suppressing the, the sulcal and ventricular signal, and look at those scans in uh, all three planes. I find that, that some localized atrophy can be um, more visible in one plane than in the other. Um, functional brain studies like FDG PET or SPECT can sometimes uh, more sensitively pick up uh, functional brain abnormalities uh, uh, than MRI scans. And amyloid PET is uh, now pretty widely available in, in the US and in Europe, uh, but once again, uh, it may not be accessible due to um, um, reimbursement by payers. We also have to consider the appropriate use criteria for amyloid PET and the fact that it's common to have amyloid PET in the brain with older age, uh, even when people don't have um, tangles and um, other pathology associated with Alzheimer's. Tau PET is emerging as a research tool and is beginning to enter the clinic, but again, is not yet very widely available. And it's important to keep in mind that the findings from these imaging modalities are really in the eye of the beholder. And I encourage everyone to look at their scans personally, going into it with a hypothesis based on the clinical um, assessment. So looking ahead, I think in the future, we're going to see uh, imaging used earlier to make an earlier diagnosis of mildly symptomatic individuals, um, to make a more confident diagnosis of mildly symptomatic and or atypical cases, and eventually to do risk assessment in asymptomatic individuals. And this will especially change as disease modifying therapies um, uh, come online. And if there is evidence that they work to delay symptoms in people with preclinical pre stages of the disease. Uh, I think we'll see these used to identify appropriate candidates for clinical trials or disease modifying therapies to predict the effects of treatment and to monitor the effects of treatment. And we've seen um, a lot of prototypes of this in the clinical trials of the um, amyloid monoclonal antibodies uh, with regard to showing that those antibodies can robustly reduce amyloid pathology, even in symptomatic patients' brains. Whether those are associated with clinical benefit, I think is still where the controversy is, but there's no question that we can measure the clearance of amyloid from the brain when those kinds of treatments are instituted. So I think it's a, a really a um, revolution in the field, the use of all of these different imaging modalities. And the more that we get molecularly specific imaging for all the neurodegenerative diseases, the more we're gonna be able to measure the effects of disease modifying therapies on those underlying disease processes. I wanna thank my team at the MGH FTD unit and Center for Translational Brain Imaging for uh, all of the passionate work that we do. This was one of our um, galas before the pandemic. And I look forward to having uh, the opportunity to get together with everyone and uh, ultimately to return to Dubai uh, for a future meeting someday in the future. Thank you and I hope, I hope you all stay well. Take care.